2001 to authorize the closure and sale of a portion of the unopened road allowance abutting the property described as plan M220 lot 543 part parcel 7494 part SPT lot 544 PCL 16268 and known locally as 8th 6th Avenue. The development services manager will confirm how notice was served to advertise the public hearing. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, the proposal to purchase the road allowance was circulated to internal staff for comments. Notice was advertised in the bulletin for three consecutive weeks and on the municipal website, sent by mail to the abutting neighbors and various agencies, and two notice signs were posted at the property entrance. Thank you. The development services manager will provide a summary of the application. A request to purchase the unopened, or sorry, through your mail, Lawrence, a request to purchase the unopened road allowance abutting uh, the property locally known as 8th 6th Avenue was submitted by the property owner, Ian Staley. It is the owner's intention to use the additional land to facilitate the aesthetic improvement of the property, as well as the surfacing of a driveway historically in use over the road allowance land. Council directed staff to move forward with the closing and sale to interested abutting property owners at the April 21st, 2021 regular council meeting. Letters were provided to landowners abutting the unopened lane. At this time, no other landowners have expressed an interest in purchasing any of the road allowance. The portion of road allowance that abuts Mr. Staley's property has not been opened as a municipal lane and so provides no public or emergency access to surrounding lands. If this area is sold, the joining landowners will not be deprived of access to the properties. The tariff of fees recommends fair market value if the addition results in a significant increase in value or a $1,000 flat fee plus HST. Council has the option to charge the flat fee or require market value appraisal to establish the price. Staff are recommending council charge the flat fee of $1,000 plus HST as the land is unlikely to add significant value to Mr. Staley's property. An administration fee of $1,250 was paid by Mr. Staley to cover the cost of advertising and staff time to process the application. The, pro uh, the purchaser is responsible for all survey costs, legal fees and registration costs. Thank you. The development services manager will read out any correspondence received from government agencies. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, no comments were received from municipal staff or government agencies. The development services manager will read out any correspondence received from members of the public. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, there was no correspondence received from the public. Thank you. The applicant or representative is invited to speak to the application if they so desire. Mr. Staley, would you like to speak to the application? Only very briefly, uh, Mayor Lawrence, uh, um, there's no other objections from other landowners or other agencies, uh, then I'd like to proceed with the, uh, the purchase as, as prescribed. Um, and I thank you for uh, looking into the matter and expediting it uh, through council. Thank you. Um, members of council, questions or comments? Members of council, I'll go around the table, starting with uh, Councillor Lego. Uh, no, I don't have any real questions. The, the road goes nowhere. It's the big rock outcrop at the top of the hill there. So I have no issue with this at all. Thank you. Councillor Bath. Yeah, no, I have no issue. Councillor Timpson. Uh, no issue. Councillor Howie. No issue, and I support the recommendation of staff. Councillor Fanlon. Uh, no problem. With it. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Oh, good with me. Very clean. Um, and we have any questions from the public, uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Kirk? Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, no, we have not uh, received any. Do I need to go through that part of the agenda then? To re Thank you. Um, this is a public hearing convened under the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 to authorize the closure and sale of shoreline road allowance abutting the property described as Plan M220, Lot 543, Part Parcel 7494, PTS, PT, Lot 544, PCL 16268, and known locally as 8th 6th Avenue. There is no appeal process. Um, that council receives this report 
we're doing the public hearing uh, motion that council receives this report respecting the road allowance closure and sale application for an unnamed laneway between Ethel Street and South Street in urban Sulagout. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. All in favor? Carried. And uh, we, Mr. Staley, just we can go, and uh, Mr. Clerk, you can confirm this at the regular council meeting. So the, since there was no feedback, mm -hmm. negative or positive, we can go to uh, make the motion in the regular meeting tonight and the business will be concluded. But that happens in the regular council meeting following this public meeting. Motion that the bylaw number 70 Dash 21 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the Municipality of Silico, July 21st, 2021 public hearing be read a first, second, and third time and passed. Moved by Councillor Howie, seconded by Councillor Timpson. All in favor? Carried. And that adjourns the public hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Staley. Uh, Thank you to you, Mayor Lawrence, and uh, all other councillors and uh, folks present on this meeting. I'll uh, I'll leave now, and uh, thanks again. Thank you. I can move straight into the uh, regular council meeting, uh, Clerk. No no change in technical matters. Okay, I'll call the regular council meeting of July twenty first to order at five thirty seven p.m. Introduction of amendments to the agenda. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, we have one, um, and it's arising from the public hearing. So we will, uh, if Council wishes, add item 7.7 .7 to the agenda, which will be the sale of an unopened road allowance, as well uh, under section 10, where the bylaws are listed, we will add bylaw number 67-21. Very good. Any further amendments? Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, I have none. So a motion that the agenda for the regular council meeting of July 21st, 2021 be approved as amended. Moved by Councillor Bath, seconded by Councillor Fenlon. All in favor? Carried. Declarations of pecuniary interest. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, we do have one this evening from Councillor uh, Cassidy. It's uh, regarding the um, delegation by the Sulaco Bombers. Um, the councillor is the director of business operations of the Junior A hockey team. Uh, so per the procedure bylaw uh, during that uh, presentation and any discussion after it, um, Councillor Cassidy will um, turn off his mic and camera. Very good. Thank you. A motion that the minutes of the regular council meeting held on June 16th, 2021, and the special council meetings held on June 24th, July 8th, and July 15th, 2021, be approved as presented. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Fallon. Any discussion? Councillor Timpson. Yeah, just a slight uh, error on. Um the minutes of uh, the regular meeting june 16th that uh, item 7.10 had indicated that there were five votes in favor of or against the resolution and actually there were only four because we were missing one counselor yeah that, think, noted, yeah. that was quoted in the paper as five to two as well so mm -hmm. small thing but good thanks for bringing that up i had made a note of it too but i was gonna I, I erroneously thought I'd bring it up under staff reports, but that's, this is the right place to bring it up. Did the staff understand that? A uh, few, Mayor Lawrence, yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, the change has been so noted and will be reflected in the minutes when they're printed for signature. Thank you. Anything further? Then all in favor? Carried, thank you. Item 4.2. That the minutes of the Kenora Home for the Aged meetings held on June 3rd, 2021 and March 25th, 2021, and the Board of Health for the Northwestern Health Unit meetings held on May 28th, 2021, and March 26th, 2021, be received. Moved by 
Councillor Timpson, seconded by Councillor Lego. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Determination of items requiring separate discussion. 7.1, runway sweeper contract award. Nope, thank you. 7.2, phase two application, Ind Indigenous Knowledge and Culture Center. Councillor Cassidy. 7.3, Umferville tra Recreation Trail Reconstruction. Councillor Cassidy. 7.4, award contract for emergency generators. Councillor Bath. 7.5, municipal office HVAC upgrades. Councillor Bath. 7.6, opportunity to promote diversity, inclusion and equity, painting pedestrian crossing. Councillor Lego. And I don't think we, I can call for 7.7, .7, uh, sale of unopened road allowance, the item that was added to the agenda following the, the uh, statutory public hearing. No, I don't see anyone. So uh, we've lifted item 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 7.5, and 7.6. A motion to adopt the items not requiring separate discussion Item 7.1 and 7.7. .7. Moved by mover, please. Councillor Fenlon, seconded by Councillor Howie. All in favor? Carried. We now move on to delegations, and we have two tonight. Uh, the first is the Sulagout Bombers, and the presenters are Austin Hoey and James Brougham. I'm not sure who, uh, are they, are they on board? Yeah, we both should be here. Yes. There's Austin and uh, the floor is, uh, is yours. Uh, I'm able to share my screen, right? Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. One second. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, for taking time to to meet with us tonight and and to listen to um, what we uh, what we have to present to uh, to the mayor and council. Uh, we just wanted to uh, to take this opportunity to kind of uh, give you guys an update and and kind of show you what we've been working on uh, in terms of the Sulaco Bombers Junior A Hockey Team. Um, so obviously, my name is Austin. I'm the director of hockey operations for the team. I'm joined by the um, Director of, uh, of Communications and Marketing, James Brown. Uh, we also have on our board, Christine Hoey as the Treasurer, um, Councillor Joe Cassidy as the Director of Business Operations, and Matt Cairns, who is the, uh, the Game Day Operations Manager. Um, so we're just gonna get right into it here. So just a quick overview of what I would like to talk about is we have our organizational structure breakdown, uh, our community relations, uh, so what our business operations are going to be, a brief summary of our financials, and then finally, um, just a, a quick little overview of our hockey operations. So if you wanna, this is kind of a, a broad look at the organizational structure that we've put in place. Uh, we're still in the process of, um, of becoming a, a, what we're going to do in terms of either a, a for-profit or a, a for-profit model, uh, non-for-profit or profit for-profit model uh, within our organization. But um, the, the goal of our group right now is we have um, our treasurer, our director of hockey operations, our director of business operations, director of marketing and community relations, and director of game day operations on our board uh, with one of the five of us being elected to uh, the chair and then any um, ex officio directors that we uh, intend to add to the board who would be non-voting members. And then we also um, intend to elect a vice chair who would act as the chair um, when, um, when the chair was not available. So just kind of a brief overview. 
uh, now I'm going to hand it off to, uh, to James Brome, uh, and he's going to let you know a little bit more about the, uh, the community relations for the Suica Bombers. Uh, thanks, Austin. Um, yeah, so, I mean, starting at the top there, business partnerships, we've had amazing support to date, um, both in our Bombers Builders campaign, and uh, we're also hosting a, uh, a golf tournament uh, in, in, in the middle of August. And uh, like I said, we've had tremendous support from, from sponsorships on, on both those fronts. Um, we will continue to, uh, to build that Bombers Builders campaign. And then next year, when we get into our uh, operations, we'll transition from sponsorships actually to advertising revenue, as opposed to just straight up sponsorships. Um, minor hockey engagement, obviously, it's uh, a big part of our uh, plan is to to try and get um, the kids engaged, uh, the kids who are um, in minor hockey now, and and hopefully increase the uh, increase the the participation in minor hockey when when kids are able to see a higher level of hockey in their hometown, um, they have a better appreciation of what uh, what is possible, um, and our players uh, hopefully will 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 find ways to. Um, engage with those uh, young players, either helping out at, um, uh, at you know, preseason camps or during the, during the season, helping out at uh, uh, player practices and that sort of thing. Um, and we're hoping that uh, our, our players become role models and, and, and good role models for, for those, those participating in minor hockey. Um, moving on to First Nations part, uh, partnerships. Um, we've had some great response, uh, obviously with COVID and now the forest fire situation, we haven't had a chance to sit down um, and hammer out any details with, um, with any of our potential First Nations partners, but um, Laxul notably and, and Cat Lake have also, uh, both expressed a, a, a their support and um, we're looking forward to seeing what um, their support would look like for us, but also how we can reciprocate that and support their community and their goals um, uh, for their young people. Um, and lastly, on this page, community involvement, uh, as you saw at the top there, we've got five members of, uh, of our board here who are deeply involved in the community, um, you know, from uh, helping out with minor hockey or sitting on boards and uh, uh, just helping out, um, Christine, obviously she's, she's done fantastic work with, uh, with golf tournaments before and with the foundation, the health, uh, health center foundation. Um, and we're hoping that our community mindedness, mindedness will, uh, filter through our organization and become part of the culture. Um, if you want to move to the next screen there, Austin. Um, just a brief overview of our operations. Like I said, um, this is not a charity. Uh, we, are, we are building a business model that has us sustaining ourselves um, and includes various revenue sources such as merchandise, which we've already started, um, operating concession stands and selling advertising both in and around the arena, plus also you know, through our, our programs and, and online and, and um, through social media. So. Um, that's a very high level view of, of what we intend to do. Um, and then of course there's to offset those uh, revenues. Of course we have our expenses, um, not the least of which is going to be ice rentals from the municipality. Um, but we also have big ticket items like transportation. And then we're going to be working with, um, folks in the community on building and accommodations and those sorts of things. So. Um, it's going to be quite a, uh, a busy schedule for, for the volunteers, for the five of us, and, and also uh, those who uh, come on board to help us out with game day and, and, uh, and all, all the other facets of the organization. So uh, I think that's it for me, and I'm going to hand it back to Austin. Thanks, James. So moving into uh, just kind of a, a broad overview of our finances, um, obviously James alluded to our Bombers Builders campaign, which is... Um, Kind of a grassroots thing that we've started where we've <clears throat> kind of gone out into the community and and identified and, and met with some businesses and some first nation communities that are interested in you know getting in at the ground floor and essentially helping us build uh this organization from the ground up 
Um, we have some financial goals in place right now. Um, I don't, uh, don't want to necessarily get into the nitty gritty of it, uh, or should I for that matter, but um, we do have a goal of, uh, of raising, getting to $150,000 um, by next summer. As of right now, we are well on our way. Um, our Bombers Builders campaign, like James mentioned, has, has been a great success. Uh, the community has shown uh, a lot of pride and a lot of uh, enthusiasm for our product. And uh, we have our golf tournament coming up here in August that we're also super excited about. The community has been super uh, welcoming towards us and we look forward to making that a yearly thing. That's something that everyone can be um, excited about. We also have our season tickets, uh, sponsorships, and then our uh, hopefully with, with working with the uh, municipalities to look out um, the concession stand as well. We've already had some meetings with, uh, with um, some of the employees at the town. And then also obviously our, our fundraising. Um, in terms of where our money is going to be coming from, the, uh, the SIJHL is uh, just like every other league in the CGHL, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, is a pay-to-play league. Um, so we estimate right around a third of, uh, of our yearly revenue is going to come directly through player fees. Um, we try, we uh, estimate another third is probably going to come from sponsorships, and then the last third would most likely come from uh, season ticket sales, uh, anything from the concession stand, fundraising, that kind of thing. Those numbers are obviously going to change and um, we'll have those numbers. We do have those numbers published in an actual budget. But again, that's one of those things that I don't really want to deep dive into here with only a couple of minutes to spare. Uh, moving forward into our hockey operations, which is kind of my, or not kind of, is, uh, is my wing of the organization, is, is we kind of um, develop what I like to call the three C's when it comes to the Bombers. And those three C's are, our culture, competitiveness, and community. And, and what I mean by those is, is we want to make sure that not only are we hiring or not hiring, but uh, finding the best hockey players, but we're finding the right hockey players that are going to succeed in a town like Soup Lookout um, that are going to, to fit into the fabric of our community and are going to be outstanding members of our, of our community. Um, we, the five of us, like to pride ourselves on being, you know, five members of, of Soup Lookout that we, we take pride in Soup Lookout and we want the best for Soup Lookout. And we want all the members of our team to feel the exact same way, whether it be the coaches, the assistant coaches, right down through the players. Um, we want to be competitive from day one. You know, one of the reasons why we started this so early is because day one, September 2022, we want to have a, a competitive product on the ice. This new model that the CGHL has brought in, where every league is a pay-to-play league, helps us drastically to come in and, and compete from day one. Um, I have a large background in hockey in uh in the Manitoba area. I have scouts right now. I have upwards of 14 scouts across North America scattered around. We're already working. Um, we're already identifying players. We already have lists in place and uh, we're excited to, to kind of start to, uh, to build a roster and to build a group that, that is going to compete and, and be competitive and try to win a championship in year one. And then finally community, you know, um, it kind of ties back to culture a little bit, but we want to make sure that, that the bombers are, are a household name in suit lookout and that only starts by not only being competitive on the ice not only being you know having good players but but being there and having guys on the ice having you know running camps running um programs in schools and we want to make sure that that we are ingrained just so long as us we are ingrained in suit lookout we want our players to be ingrained in suit lookout. and that's why we want to engage with the next generation of bombers and i've said this before uh, on interviews but i do think it's very important is um you know i'm the head coach of the high school hockey team right now and and I don't think there's anything wrong with, with, with guys playing high school hockey. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I know a lot of good players who have gone up through that system. But um, I think that in minor hockey in, in general, when, when kids are playing minor hockey, whatever the highest level of hockey is in their community, that's kind of the level that you set in the back of your mind that that's the kind of hockey that I want to play. I know that when I was a kid, there wasn't a junior team here. So in the back of my mind, I always wanted to play for the Warriors. What we believe is going to happen is we have the Bombers now. Now the minor hockey kids, well, rather than thinking about playing for the Warriors, which they 100% will be, but we want to get them thinking about playing for the Bombers. And, you know, raising that level from here to up here is just going to create a better minor hockey environment for Sioux Lookout. It's going to create more players. And, and I think it's, it's only going to be um, a, a net positive for us. Um, so this is just kind of our timeline as we go into 2022, 2021. So we had our public launch back in April. Um, we now have our merchandise supplier in James at Catspaw. 
we had a goal of fifty thousand dollars to be in the bombers builder funds in may of 2021 which we did get um we're in the process of finding team transportation uh in august we're going to have our blueberry festival open house fundraiser which is going to be like a barbecue uh plans are still in motion for that we've actually moved up our bombers golf tournament it's now going to be in the middle of august as well we look to have a hundred thousand dollars in our bombers fund by the end of september 2021 and again that's right on schedule with our builders, with our golf tournament. Um, we'd like to get our RFP for transportation in and around that date uh, at the end of October. Then into 2022, we'd like to have our transportation contract in place at the start of the year. Uh, we've been in works with the SIJHL to host a regular season game this upcoming season, which we're very excited about. Um, that obviously details to be worked out. We're gonna have our first ID camp either in February, March, or April, depending on when that's going to be. We'd like to hold two to three of those. We'd then like to hire our head coach right around that same time. Um, our first rookie camp will be in July. And then at that point, we'd also like to have the $150,000 in our building campaign. Our main camp will be in August. And then we're basically going to start up play in September of 2022. So um, with that being said, uh, we'd like to open the floor to questions from council or, uh, or the mayor. And uh, we'd be happy to either answer those questions or um, if it's a question that is better suited for one of our other board members, we'd love to take that question and then uh, and then get back to you with an answer. Thanks very much, Austin. I'll uh, go around the council table and uh, see. Uh, Councillor Fanlon. No, I have no comments on it. Thank you, Councillor Howie. No comments, just a great presentation, James and Austin, and I wish the Bombers uh, the most success in any uh, ongoing discussions with the municipality. So Thanks, great work, looking forward to it. Thank you. Councillor Timpson. Yeah, just a question, presumably it's an all male team. There's no, no women involved in this? Um, well, uh, well, technically it, it is not technically all male. Um, there's a very good chance that, that every player will be male but the rules do not state that all players have to be male. Are you, are you promoting women to, um, young women to uh, apply and uh, audition? Well, for I would say that we are looking to find the, uh, the best uh, 25 players that we can, um, gender notwithstanding. Okay. Possibly that should be made um, obvious to some of the women so that they would know that they are invited to apply. I think it would be worthwhile. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Thank, thank you, Councillor Thompson. We, yeah. we do right. have congratulations oh, on your. No, I was just gonna say congratulations on the work you've done so far. Sorry, oh, AJ. Thank you. Yeah, and we we do have some um, work to do in defining, um, you know, how how our our hockey team is different or the same as other hockey teams in the league and across the country. Um, and definitely, we we as a new team have an opportunity to, to define ourselves, not to change a culture, but actually create one. So those are all questions that we are gonna be asking of ourselves as well. So thanks for the question. Great, good to hear that. Councillor Bath. Yeah, great presentation guys. I, I'm really happy to see the, the community spirit you get out of something like this and if Austin, if you're energy can communicate into the community spirit and the growth of the team. It's going to be a heck of a team. Good work. Thanks, John. Thank you. Councillor Lego. Yeah, just want to thank you guys for giving the community a bit of light of hope uh, as we've moved through this year and a half of dreary COVIDness. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's a great thing for our community. So thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Councillor Lego. And I'll just uh, sum up by I echo everything the council has said here. Very supportive, uh, great work. Excited to see the bombers. I think you're doing it right. You're taking your time and and uh, building the uh, I think you call it the builder the builders fund. <clears throat> uh, the environment is right, and uh, I think with the group you've got, you have every opportunity of success. And I I think you will have success. So keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Anything further? Uh, no, that was it from us. So thank you very much on behalf of council for your presentation. Very well received. Thank you.
So we now move to back to uh, staff reports. Uh, sorry, Mayor Lawrence, we do have a second delegation this evening. Uh, did I miss that? <laughs> I was just kidding. <laughs> um, delegation number two. Of transit, municipal engagement and strategic planning. Uh, the presenter will be Wally Beck, the president of Transit Consulting Network. Are you on board, Wally? You are. Nice to meet you. And uh, the table is yours. Okay, thank you. I want to make sure. Okay. I see I'm missing this yep. here. We can see your slideshow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now I got it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Mayor Lawrence and members of council and uh, uh, public of Sioux Lookout, uh, it's, a it's a pleasure to present this, uh, the culmination of our study that we have uh, just finished with the Andy Transit Inc. Board of Directors, so here we go. So a quick overview, I'll try to get through this in about 10 minutes. Chances are you'll have uh, a lot of questions, you can hold off till the end. So this is what I'm gonna talk about, first of all, you know, talk about how transit's role, you know, what did we look at in the study? You know, what, what are other communities doing in public trans, transportation? Uh, what's the plan going forward? Uh, and what's required? What are the challenges, opportunities? And then most important, I think, uh, discussion could uh, go, uh, uh, have, we can have some discussions on some next steps. So in terms of, a, you know, a rural transit market, you're dealing with captive residents, those people that can't drive, can't afford to drive, and uh, and those are starting to be a growing number of seniors. They want to age in place. They don't want to depend on family and friends for rides. Uh, a big a big market with First Nations with the new the, the influx of uh, new residents, whether they be temporary or long term for uh, grade seven and to twelve students. Uh, transit today. Uh, is a lot different than previous generations when I grew up and when many most of us grew up. You've got millennials out there. They're not buying cars. <laughs> Some don't even get licenses. Uh, more people are financially aware of the benefits. And there's a lot of uh, studies out there and they'll say for every dollar that you invest in transit, you're going to generate a dollar sixty in return in your community. Uh, some say two dollars, so, but they're all over the map. But this one, uh, just to give you an idea, there are economic benefits to having transit. Uh, in terms of the other benefits, generally not well understood. Uh, a lot of it's uh, social, the health benefit, getting people around. It's environmental. Uh, there are, you know, electric vehicles coming on stream uh, that you may want to look at. The other thing is when you put, have transit, you're not gonna, if you expand transit, you're not gonna have people sell their cars overnight. But with a healthy transit system in, in there for the long term, people might get rid of that second or third vehicle that they have. So there's a financial benefit there. And they and in turn, those, those savings are gonna spent in the be spent in the community. I've done uh, rural transit studies across Canada internationally. And there's a, a lot of similar stories that I hear out there. The other thing to remember too, if, if I'm a Sioux Lookout resident taxpayer and I'm, I'm, I'm paying taxes, I don't drive, but uh, I'm paying taxes for roads. And uh, especially in communities where there is no transit, I'm paying taxes for roads, but I don't get to use them. So what do I get in return? So public transit offers something for those that can't afford the car that are subsidizing through their taxes, people that do have a car. So this is what we looked at. Phase, there are two phases. One is we looked at the needs and priorities. Uh, there's, you know, transit can't be all things to all people, but so what are the priorities? Um, and then we developed a plan based on that, plan, uh, the input we received from the uh, various stakeholders that we talked to. So we talked, uh, excuse me. So one of the things 
municipalities ask, uh, especially if they're new to transit, what's everybody else doing? How do we compare to them? So the Canadian Urban Transit Association develops numerous statistics. This is just a handful of them. So I looked at Sioux Lookout in 2019, the very first full year of service, and compared them to other systems in that were out there in 2018. This is all pre-COVID numbers. And what we and um, we're not designing a watch here, but I'm going to give you some uh, a quick overview of some of the stats uh, that we've looked at. One being on a per capita day basis, how much service are you providing, or how much is provided in the municipality? So it works out to roughly half an hour per man, woman, and child that you have in Sioux Lookout. Is how does that compare to the others? Well, most of the, the, the median, like for the uh, uh, the trend. 10 municipal systems that we looked at, it's roughly 0.6 hours. Um, but, and so you're well below that, but you'll see some systems with uh, an hour or 1.1 hours per capita. I think a mature system over time should have about that number. Um, now, is the service efficient, okay? In the first full year of operation, I, I'm impressed by these numbers, by the way. You're carrying roughly four, you got two vehicles out there, you're carrying roughly four vehicles per hour per vehicle. And the, the average is seven, but you're talking about uh, buses on a fixed route, mature transit systems. Here I'm looking at statistics from your first full year of operation. And uh, based on what I've seen, I'm, uh, I was, uh, Quite impressed. The other thing to remember, it's not just buses going up and down the street. It's it's you've got two vehicles. One is a fixed route, a scheduled service, and the other one's on demand. So you have you don't travel as quickly, but your numbers are still quite high. And I hope I didn't confuse things. But um, in the first year, I was really impressed. Financial efficiency. You know what's it cost? Fifty five bucks an hour. That's pretty darn good. That's one of the lowest and uh, well below the uh, average of the peer group. And that, that peer group number, $68 or $66, is from 2018. And so you compare very, very well. Average fare, you're, like today the cash fare is about four bucks. And so the average fare that year was uh, one of the, it's way higher than the mean. But I, I, I thought that was impressive because first of all, you, you got a small urban area, like you go to a big city, you go to Sudbury, you pay a few bucks, you can, you're on the bus for an hour, an hour and a half. But here you're, you're on the bus for about 15, 20 minutes and you're paying three dollars, the average fare is say $4 today. So to be able to get that is, is, is uh, uh, an achievement. In terms of municipal investment, um, what are other municipalities spending? So what we do is we look at the total dollar spent by municipality, in, in, in the case of Sioux Lookout, be through your grants. And uh, so the average of the peer group that we looked at is somewhere around 13, just over $13. Sioux so Lookout's about six bucks. And, uh, and I thought, you know, that's the average, you know, if you look at the total of all municipalities in Ontario that have transit with less than 50,000 population, it's around $20. So you're, that's why I say you're getting a very good uh, uh, service for the dollar that you're getting. And these are the reasons. One is you've got a not-for-profit of transiting, uh, fundraising activities, you've got high bus fares, and your costs are low. So that. I think minimizes the deficit or for the uh, grants that are required. Now, the key to this was look, talking to stakeholders. Unfortunately, I couldn't get to Sioux Lookout because of COVID. I would have all these focus group meetings. So a lot of these were Zoom calls and one-on-one -on -one conversations. So we looked at all those that provide transportation in the, to and from the city and within the, or to and from the town and within the town. And then we talked to all the stakeholders. We talked to community living. To, uh, to area activity center, the uh, community social services, uh, First Nations Health, Health Authority, uh, Gamut Friendship, uh, Friendship Center, excuse me. 
So those are the agencies we talk to. And so what did they tell us? You know, and we just asked them about Hub Transit and they said, it's really helped. It really helped our clients. And a lot of them said, it's a health benefit. And I pointed that out earlier because it is. <laughs> uh, and it's essential for the community at large, um, First Nations especially, and the local seniors that really depend on it. Uh, and, and the fact that they're, they also are telling me, especially First Nations, say, hey, we're growing big. We're, we're really growing. And especially for medical trips and grade seven to 12 students, and we're gonna need tra public transit to accommodate their need. Um, COVID also impacted everybody as it did hub transit and every transit system in North America. Uh, the other thing we found, bus schedules aren't really that reliable. Uh, the needs, the routes have to be more direct. I mean, you can walk some places, you know, in 15 minutes, but it could take you an hour to get there by bus. So what can you do to fix it? They'd like to see the service start earlier and later so people get to and from work on time, uh, service on weekends and so on. Uh, the other one was drivers use cell phones uh, as, safe, as safely as they can. Maybe they can do something to uh, have another way of communication other than cell phones. And oh, one other thing is the Maidens Who Look Out partnerships. There's a great opportunity there. And this is what I'm hearing from all the various groups that we've talked to, I've talked about. So route and service plan, this is, or, you know, what we're looking at is modifying the routes and schedules. I mean, we've got, it's in the report that the, the board has, increase hours of operations, do it if there's a business case to do it. And then the other thing that and I think you might have heard, everybody's heard about Innisville's Uber Transit. So this is really micro transit and there are opportunities to provide us uh, on-demand service with a mobile app, as well as being able to use a telephone to book rides. So that's one of the things that we're looking at, we've looked at actually. All these funding programs are in place, more today than, I, I, I've been in this business 46 years, and, and, and there's more funding out there today than there was back then. So there's uh, community transportation grant funding, uh, gas tax and donations that are uh, happening with today. The province provides for every two uh, liter of gasoline that's sold, two cents goes to municipalities that support public transit. So you're doing that with your donations, for example. Uh, and then let's say, uh, Sue so Lookout gets $100 in funding, up to $75 can also uh, be added to that from the gas tax uh, if you haven't maxed out in what the province will provide you. And, and make no mistake, if you don't use it, it'll go to the larger centers in Toronto that are taking up 90% of the, the funding there. Um, so roughly you get about $8 per capita, 30, 30 cents per passenger is what it is the average in Ontario uh, a couple of years ago. The other thing to remember is for every dollar that you, in, uh, that you provided uh, in grant, Hub Transit provided $3.30 worth of service. So um, I, I thought that was quite impressive. And again, a lot of that has to do with the funding uh, uh, that's provided in the uh, fundraising. So future business models, government governance, transit systems can go from 100% uh, private sector, you know, they take all the risk, they invest all the money uh, to, and manage the service to 100% municipal, owned and operated. So, and there's everything else in between. Uh, you're somewhere, uh, right now it's in between. So here are the challenges and opportunities that we found uh, through our research and, and talking to the communities. You've got a board of directors that have started this since 2018. They're gonna be transitioning out, their, out of their active roles. They've gotten this service up to where it is today. I'm impressed with it, but, and it's working. So <clears throat> they tried to hire a, an operations, or, um, coordinator or manager, whatever you want to call it. It was difficult and, uh, and they still haven't done that. But even if they did, um, uh, you have to still strengthen relationships 
with all the businesses, social service agencies, and First Nations. You know, they have to be strengthened. One person isn't going to do that. You need municipal involvement to help facilitate or coordinate it. Um, transit system staff have to liaise with municipal staff, public works, parks and rec, uh, finance, and everything. So they, they have to have ongoing communications with staff at various levels because, you know, people want to take a bus to a rec center. They want to go to the, the arena. They, you know, um, bus stops have to be maintained. Public works looks after that. They have to be accessible. So, and the other role of a director would do is a manager was to look at continuous improvement, improving the transit system ongoing, and also uh, prepare reports and do research. The industry is changing, mobile apps, Uber, all, all this stuff is changing all the time. So somebody has to keep on top of that. So, but here are the opportunities I found. And this again, came from your community stakeholders. The partners, especially First Nations, uh, and uh, are willing to, to want to work with Hub Transit. They've got unmet needs, unmet needs that are arising, uh, especially with the, not only the, uh, temporary medical uh, <clears throat> uh, residents flying into suit, but also grade seven to 12 students. Funding programs pop up now and then, and <clears throat> recently they just announced some more, to, and I'll get into that. So somebody's got to keep on top of these things. <clears throat> so over the first four years, um, there's a demonstrated need for the service. You're carrying four passengers per hour or eight hours per hour if you combine both vehicles. So there is a need for it. Uh, a more, we feel that a more prominent municipal role can enhance hub transit's credibility to the community and all the various stakeholders and all the other agencies, especially First Nations, and of course the public. It has. Um, uh, the community transportation grant, by the way, has just uh, in the last two weeks or three weeks has now been ex extended to 2025. So there's time, you've got these uh, things to, to do, and these are the things that I think make sense to do next. Hub Transit, the board has got to confirm the final route and the service design that we prepared in the, in the the operational review, look at possibly entering uh, an agreement with the third party. So you leave the, the operations, the day-to-day -day stuff operations to a third party and manage it outside of that. So that's one of the things that we looked at and I think uh, is worth pursuing uh, at the end of the study. Travel training, this is really important. Travel training is, okay, I'm a senior citizen, um, my, my spouse drove all the time. I don't know how to drive. I can't drive. So how do I take the bus? So that's travel, showing seniors how to take uh, the bus or First Nations students when they first come into town, how to get around town. So this travel training is also provided to those that, that are ambulatory disabled or, or in wheelchairs. So there's a travel training component. And what I found interesting is social services, First Nations, everybody said, hey, we can do that. You train us, give us, tell us how to train us, and we'll train all our clients. So it takes the onus off the transit operator. Uh, uh, what, uh, low cost marketing and branding of the service. Put up bus stops. You need more bus stops, by the way. And having a Sioux Lookout bus stop, a transit bus stop, or a hub transit bus stop, promotes the service. Um, in terms of uh, vehicles, they need one, they need another one right now. <laughs> They've got two and one's in pretty dire shape. Uh, and the other uh, most important one is accelerate engagement with residences, businesses, various social service agencies, First Nations organizations. Uh, they're all, they all wanna get on board, they all, all wanna meet, but <laughs> here's the problem. We gotta look at it somewhat of a different business model. So before the grant expires in 2025, we got, you got to de decide how the community wants to move forward with a, 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 not just a business model, but 
a sustainable model. So a business model is, you know, how is the service delivered? And the governance structure is, well, who's going to call the shots and who gets service and when? So that's the governance model. So there needs to also be a transit champion. Transit. Right now we have one, <laughs> and uh, and we have one. They're in the board members, but you need somebody there on a day-to-day, -day, continual basis at full time. Municipal involvement, I think, is needed uh, to help facilitate just ongoing engagement. Uh, give the credibility that the, the board needs and the, the operator needs. The, uh, in the end, you know, the bottom line is uh, the, the, the town's requested to help them overcome the challenges and, and cap help capitalize on, uh, on the opportunities that are out there. There's a lot of them. Uh, the learning, learning curve is minimal. The system's been up and running for four years. And uh, the other thing too is municipal funds aren't required. Okay, no more funds are required. Now, of transit's role, I talked about it. This is the summary. Uh, we, you looked at, you, you know, it compares well to a, its peer systems. Give you a quick overview of what the community thinks and their feedback. We talked about the transit plan, business models, the challenges and opportunities moving forward and the next steps and hub transit this is where hub transit needs help engaging with community stakeholders number one and determine there's a million dollars to spend over the next few years they want to make sure that this it's spent the way the community wants it spent so that means prioritizing how this money is spent and because your counselors you know your you know your constituents better than anybody and perhaps you can now work with uh, up transit a little more uh, moving uh, going forward. And I believe now what I've done, I, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been in this business for 46 years. I half my career has been working in a, you know, running transit systems in a municipal environment. The other half is as a consultant. And, and so I saw these stories about small communities all across Canada and about and so a lot of feasibility studies were being done transit feasibility studies and so i wrote a paper called right sizing transit what's a reasonable level investment and it was geared it's at a transportation association of canada conference and it talks to uh counselors it talks to you know public work staff uh planning staff people that have very little knowledge about transit puts it in perspective of the role transit place in the community and and if you do get there you know what's transit going to look like so we're not saying you know you jump in with both feet i think it you know when you start a new transit system my what i've learned is it takes about a high school generation to get it up and going and that's about what happened with hub transit except throwing thrown in the mix is COVID, and so that really threw it for a loop but i think Moving forward, post-COVID, there's uh, a lot of opportunities. And uh, thank you for your time. I'm here for any questions you may have. Thanks, Wally. Uh, so uh, perhaps it would be helpful if we can stop sharing the screen and then I can I can see all the councillors, but uh, uh, I'll go around the table for questions. Uh, start with uh, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Wally. Um, just a question with regards to your engagement with all the organizations in town the one thing i noticed is that there's a lot more passenger vans um being operated by these organizations what impacts do you see that having on hub transit in its future okay, uh, it sounds uh breaking up but i think i heard the question is oh, oh, all these uh uh, new vans, I, I think uh, First Nations Health Authority has them. They can accommodate certain trips, but if it's for leisure trips, that sort of thing, they're trips that they aren't supplying service for. So this is where public transit comes in handy. That's it, Councillor Cassidy. Yep, yep that was it for me. Thank you. Councillor Fenlon. 
No, I have no comment for. Thank you. Councillor Howie. Thank you, Wally, for the presentation. I, I did like your mention of, of the use of micro transit. I know um, similar models have been have been attempted in Sulaco with the, the issue being employment of drivers. Uh, would there be a model you'd suggest or has there been any kind of uh, successful models you've seen used uh, previously in, in smaller municipalities? Um, actually, there, there are uh, a number out there. There's uh, a lot in Southern Ontario, um, uh, South Central Ontario, and uh, you have a company called Driver's Seat right there in Thunder Bay. They also, you know, they're a franchise operation. They also put the operations in uh, uh, Southwest Ontario. So that there, there are com competitors out there. And I am working with a, another small municipal transit system supplier, and we're working with one of the, the uh, um, micro transit uh, uh, company. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Timpson. Uh, thanks, Wally. You no, know, that was a very interesting presentation. We appreciate the work that uh, Hub Transit is doing here in service for the people. Thank you. Councillor Lego. Yeah, no, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, we'll see. You. How this proceeds and goes forward. Um, I like the idea that you pointed out of having a third party to run it. That sounds like some of the board members are getting worn out. It's been a long haul for them. Uh, and it didn't help that COVID came along and sort of stopped everything from moving forward. Um, and I like the idea of um, maybe the municipality's role would be to facilitate between eight other agencies and, and, and hub transit. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Councillor Bath. The Tuesday remains silent. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Bath. Uh, thanks very much, Wally. If I, the challenges you're facing now, if I, if I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to be um, in part uh, the board needs to transition out and, and, and you're doing a strategic plan and you would like engagement from the municipality perhaps on that strategic plan. Did I read uh, that correctly? Yes. Yes, they need the board needs assistance to to yeah. undertake a strategic plan. That's right. Uh, and uh, I'm just wondering that would be uh, the board would be joined by staff, or how how would you see how did you see that? Did you have a particular picture there? Uh, um, you know, I think it makes sense to have your senior staff sit down with the board and and maybe you know go over a strategy over the next over the next while to see what makes sense just to bounce things off off each other but there are a lot of needs and and you can't certainly do this answer that question in a couple of minutes but there are a lot of uh, uh, you know there's a lot of holes that need to be filled because you don't have any full-time hub transit staff yeah so, and, and you know what well, you have you have drivers but uh, not uh, that's not right management staff yeah and hub and, and hub and municipal staff will be involved at some point regardless you know like i want to put in a bus stop i have to go through traffic right so it needs no removal i need to make it a site accessible you know so the municipality plays a role uh regardless so i mean it's a in some ways it's uh, the timing is good uh, if I understand, there are three years left on the grant. Twenty, it expires in twenty twenty five. We're in year. Are we in the third year now, or in the second yes. year? Yeah, it's uh, March thirty uh, first, twenty twenty five. So yeah, a solid three years left yeah. of of a good grant. The hub transit is a good financial position, and if I read into it, you're. Uh, Getting a manager has been hard. It's, I mean, there's a labor shortage everywhere, and, and uh, small operations like Hub Transit have had difficulty in engaging a manager to oversee the operations, which has left it to the board. Um, and, and this is a challenge. And the board perhaps doesn't have the sway. I think I saw on one of the slides that the municipality, with its 
<laughs> clout, if we can call it that, um, uh, we can uh, perhaps have more uh, influence in bringing in talking to uh, agencies, businesses, etc., bring them to the table in the planning yes. process. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Yep. So I, I think uh, just before we we sign off here, I, I guess uh, staff, I'm looking at UCAO. Um, it, it seems like. Uh, uh, perhaps from this presentation and I think the timing is good I don't th and on one hand I know that the grant has a few years to run but on the other hand I think that the board is is reaching out now to make sure there's a timely uh, engagement and, and proper planning they're at a stage where they'd like to do st strategic planning but really need a municipal engagement to do so CIO do you have any any thoughts on how that might happen uh, yes um <clears throat> Um, I understand that there's a full report that you submitted to the board, right, uh, Mr. Back? Yes, there is. Okay, so um, perhaps we'll, um, uh, following this meeting, I'll discuss it with staff and undertake uh, and determine who will be meeting with the, with the board uh, to have those initial discussions and um, perhaps get a copy of that report as a start so that uh, we get the detail of it and uh, we'll set up a meeting and move that process forward. And that would be the CIO, you'd communicate with the Hub Transit locally? Correct. Your, is your role now done, uh, Wally? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll provide some uh, assistance as the project winds down, but this is the end of my uh, work. Sure. But, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know what? I, I'm just a full call away. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know. CIO? I was just going to suggest. I, I believe John is uh, John Bath is the chair of the um, of the Handy Transit Board, so we'll we'll communicate through John uh, to set up, up that meeting and move forward. And if the uh, board determines that they want any further um, information or assistance from Mr. Beck, uh, we'll we'll certainly uh, we'll certainly go that route. Very good. Anything further, Council? And uh, Mr. Beck, thank you. Thank you very much for a good presentation, and thanks to the Hub Transit board members for all they do for our, our community. Uh, I, I know that uh, Rob's on, uh, McLennan is on on the Zoom call here, and uh, there's I think other board members may be watching. So, thanks to the board for for bringing a successful uh, transit operation into into play in Sulacoat and, and really transitioning from the previous. Uh, small uh, group that was running what was then and I guess we're still are you still called handy transit was that the the name of the previous group I, I see it on your it was, slides you were called yeah. handy transit so yeah it was it was handy transit yeah so Please. thanks very much uh, board and thanks Wally for a great presentation pleasure meeting you all thank you All right, Council, uh, we can now move on to staff reports, item 7.2. Did I get it right this time, Mr. Clerk? No? Oh, go ahead. A uh, few other ones. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to uh, point out, it appears that uh, Councillor Howie is having some connectivity issues. He was out back in and he's out again now. So uh, he, I'm not sure if he'll be rejoining or not, but uh, I just want Council to be aware of that. Okay, I noticed there was some uh, waffling of sound on a couple of, is that, is everybody experiencing that or is it just, you're experiencing it a bit? Yeah. Uh, to email Lawrence, um, I, I think that uh, that was at the end users uh, bandwidth issues at their end as opposed to, um, and we're just seeing the effects of the lack of band bandwidth. Okay, thanks. And Councillor Howie has rejoined us. There he is, okay, great. Item 7.2, um, the council approve a phase two application for $368,050 to Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation Community Enhancement Program, Rural Enhancement Funding, and the council amend resolution number CL130-19, a municipal contribution of 85,000 and support the new municipal contribution of 123,000 plus any cost overruns to create an indigenous knowledge and culture center. Uh, need a motion, a mover to put that on the table. Moved by Councillor Fenlon, seconded by Councillor Bath. 
And we'll start the discussion with Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, my question for staff is in the application, it mentions hiring a full-time coordinator and two positions. Who will be funding those positions? Through, through you, Mayor Lawrence, the application itself has, um, we've requested funding for a individual for to help get the project up and going. Um, if we hear that uh, the funding is approved and as the progress, as the project progresses, um, as of right now, the museum is located within the recreation and culture budget. Um, so we would have a look at that through our budget process when it, um, when it comes time. By supporting this application, we're not endorsing the, that creation yet. That would still have the creation of those positions. It still have to be worked out through the budget process. Correct. Um, follow up with that. Has there been any engagement with um, Library and Archives Canada or the Canadian Music Museum Association? Those were two organizations. Um, call in the calls to action that were brought out. Um, is there, has there been any engagement on our part with them to potentially support this position or the, um, any of the technology and the databases that we're maintaining and create a partnership there that could help um, cover some of the operations of this? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I'd have to look at the project a little bit uh, more to determine whether or not um, communication had occurred with those uh, individuals. And just uh, one more, is there any engagement from any of our First Nations partners with, with the, what sounds like it would be municip the municipality handling First Nations archives and databases, do we have any partnerships or anything that has been worked through any of our First Nations partners in the area? So through you, Mayor Lawrence, the uh, Sulaco Public Library right now received a, um, a trillium fund to uh, take documentation um, from a couple of the reserves and start archiving them and everything. They are working with individuals to make sure that that is all um, put together properly and respectfully. And um, the depths of that project, I'm not 100% um, sure about. So I'd have to look into it more to make sure that um, everything is done correctly, but I do believe that there has been communication with uh, Laxul in regards to it. Eck? Yeah, I'll get to you, Councillor Timpson. Yeah, Councillor Cassidy, are you, are you finished? Um, no, I just the last, I guess, kind of to wrap it all up. Um, my hope is that with some of these other partnerships or other agencies that we should engage with, I would hope that some of the funding to cover these positions and what in the within this uh, Indigenous Knowledge Center could be covered through other agencies, um, because that is some of the calls to action call for, for this type of uh, database to be created and for them to be the ones that support it. So, if there's partnerships there, that'd be great um, to see to see that come to fruition. So, those are my only comments to to try and. Uh, to tease those out and establish those. Thank you. Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I was just gonna clarify on the issue of consultation with First Nations. Uh, with respect to the Pelican Falls archives, yes, there has been that whole uh, collection of data that there has been discussion with the archives about that through Dr. Um, uh, can't think of his name. Do we? Brendan, yeah, Tui, yeah. And um, there's a, a, a community engagement library uh, librarian, um, Crystal Harrison Collin, who is has taken on the project, and she has uh, put together an elders advisory group of uh, Laxul of Laxul um, 
uh, members uh, that would work on how this data would be used and presented. Um, so it's still in its initial stages. It got, again, COVID hijacked the process, but um, it, is in, it is in the works. Thank you. I'll just go around the council table. Councillor uh, Howie, are you back with? Yeah, you're here. I'm here, yeah. Sorry, my uh, Wi-Fi connection is quite unstable. So um, I, I did catch what Councillor Cassidy was saying, and I do uh, support an, an increase in engagement uh, with Indigenous partners and organizations, communities. Um, and hopefully through that, we could build partnerships in the actual operations um, of the facility. But that's my, my only comment. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fanon. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a long time, this project moving forward. It's nice to see that uh, something is happening and could see an ending to it and coming. That's it. Thank you. Councillor Lego. Yeah, is uh, phase two the, the final phase or are, is, is there another phase? Through you, Mayor Lawrence, phase two is the final phase. Okay, because uh, the increase of 45% of or the $38,000 is, is quite a jump um, to ask the uh, tax base to, uh, to take on that hit. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, just like 7.5 where we use reserves, is there reserves available to cover this extra 38,000 and then still maintain what we had decided on at, at that $85,000 to come from long-term debt? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, there are uh, a couple of avenues that I could possibly look at um, in regards to the project itself. And um, so that, that could be a possibility. I can look at it a little bit further. Okay, and what's the time frame to have this phase two application in? Are we up against the wire here or do we have some time? Uh, through, through you, Mayor Lawrence, once uh, council makes a decision on this matter, the application would be sent in right away. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Bath. Yeah, that's good. I'm 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 very interested in in uh, you know seeing the uh, the knowledge that's in the in in, in the area come for, forward and be available to the public. I just hope that the uh, the other other municipalities or, or or folks around the community would be supporting to luck out in in uh, having this thing move forward. Thank you. I saw CEO CAO. Were you uh, about to make a comment? I was, but uh, our treasurer, Carly uh, Collins, uh, covered it off. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased to see the project move ahead. I think it's a, um, a very cost-effective use of the space in the library that, that's already there uh, it, uh, to, to finish this space off. And it uh, also uh, means that uh, I think the railway station is freed up. So there's a, there's, a, there's a considerable cost savings here that the municipality will realize, I think, in the end. I also think there's an opportunity. I know we, we started off with the concept of Indigenous Knowledge Centre. And I wonder if that's a bit presumptive for a municipality to do that without partnerships with First Nations. Uh, but I think uh, given uh, what's transpired over the last uh, few months um, in terms of uh, uh, Canada's relationship with First Nations and, and the, the unmarked burials, et cetera, there, there is an atmosphere and a mood to, for reconciliation again. And I think that there, uh, there is opportunities here to, to uh, take this project in, in a slightly different direction. Uh, perhaps it's not Indigenous Knowledge Centre, perhaps it's a re reconciliation centre. I think the opportunity is Councillor Cassidy started and others have mentioned for partnerships and to seek out those kind of partnerships. Uh, with First Nations and First Nation agencies is, I think there, we should pursue that opportunity opportunity for wholeheartedly. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of this. Anything further, Council? Councilor Cassidy. Sorry, just one more point I had, Councilor Lag Lago jogged my memory there. Um, in the application, it says that the in 2019, the funds were approved and put into the reserves yet in the report it, it shows long-term debt um i just to clarify that in the uh in the actual application 
if that's the case, if it's coming out of long-term debt or if the money's already set aside in reserves. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I'd have to look back into that uh, report and uh, see exactly what occurred. Page five, section 2.3. That's all. Thank you. So presumably, uh, Treasurer, that would be part of your look-see in terms of can we use reserves or not? Is that is that part of that question, CAO? I think what Councillor Cassidy is referring to is in the previous, is it a reporter application that it was indicated that the money was actually set aside in reserves? Um, in the application, it says the municipality approved the funding for this project in the 2019 municipal budget, and it was put into reserve funds to cover the application share of the project and for any cost overruns to be covered by the municipality. Um, I, I may be speaking out of turn, but I don't think that happened. But we will verify. Anything further, Council? Then I uh, will call the motion that's on the floor. Uh, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item 7.3. The Council authorizes and directs staff to submit a phase one application to the Canada Community Revitalization Fund. CCRF for the reconstruction of the Umfreville Recreation Trail. Moved by Councillor Fenlon, seconded by Councillor Howie. And I'll start the discussion with Councillor Cassidy. Um, yes. Um, first comment on this is um, 27 hours to consider a $1 million long term debt decision is relatively short turnaround. Um, so my question is what other considerations and what other projects did we look at to, uh, to potentially upgrade our assets or repair deficiencies in our assets? Uh, uh, I was going to say, I was going to ask the CAO, I, I, uh, perhaps CAO, you could refer to the, um, the sports uh, tourism strategy and the, the applications we had at that time were? So what happened back when we had the sports tourism strategy, council recalls we had an opportunity to um, apply for significant funds for brand new facilities. And so it was decided at that time a, count, a report was presented to council uh, on a couple options for upgrading um, uh, various facilities in the municipality and the Umferville Trail was one of them. It was later um, decided that because this funding was coming out that we would go after a brand new facility to incorporate uh, multifaceted uh, recreation aspects of it, including a pool. So we went for that. That was a different funding stream. This is a funding stream that just came out in the last two, two and a half weeks. Council uh, staff did not have a lot of time to prepare and go out and look at other projects, although we know that there's significant projects out there that could be used. We had already cost estimates from a previous report that went to council that Mr. Jewell had done, our former public works manager. So we decided to put a report together because it has to be submitted by the 23rd of July. So we decided to put a report together to try and maximize funding on this uh, trail system because it's very heavily used by the public and tourists and uh, especially now with the hostel being at the former day's end, it's have more heavily used by pedestrians uh, walking into town that don't normally have vehicles. So we thought that this would be a good project, a good fit. We discussed it with our counterparts uh, at FEDNOR, the funders, our advisors, and they thought it was a good project on sh a short notice and we had the estimates. So part of the problem, we did consider some other projects, but part of the problem is, is we couldn't get estimates together fast enough to submit the application. So in the future, these are some of the projects we're going to be working on to get those estimates so that we're ready for when project funding comes out. That's Councilor, all thank you. That's all. Sorry, Councilor Cassidy. That's yeah. all this thank you. Uh, Councilor Lego. Yeah, um, I'm sure there's a, a long list of other pending and deteriorating infrastructure 
uh, needs and demands um, that we should be looking at first uh, before we go looking at asking the residents to pay another $900,000 in long-term debt. So I'm, I'm a no on this one. Thank you, Councillor Bath. Well, certainly the Umberville Trail has been always has been on council uh, mind for a few years. I think we we started maintaining it probably in the first year that I was on council. And I, and it, you, when you go and look at it now, it's very very busy. It's a very popular municipal uh, um, um, entity. And I think it, it encourages the, the use of the outdoor recreation. It's a, a much less expensive way to provide recreation than, than certainly an arena or something like that. I, the, it seemed like an awful lot of money for the trail and, and whether the whole trail needs repairs, but I, I'm, I'm torn whether I support the, uh, I kind of follow Mr. Uh, Counselor Lego's comment, that's a lot of money to put into it. But on the other hand, it's uh, it's something that's really needed, and, and recreation needs to be part of what, what we're supporting. So, I'm probably going to support it. I'm sort of sitting here on the fence for a minute, though. Thank you, um, Councillor Timpson. Well, I would, yeah, it it, it is. Let me let me be honest. It's it's disappointing that um, a, a service that. It's really not been high profile in terms of the needs. It's had, there's been nothing from the public about um, Fairville Trail. From what I can see, it's operating very nicely. There may be that need repairs, but um, two million dollars. It'll come out to two million dollars, basically. Um, I don't know. I, I'd like to see that two million dollars divided. Maybe take some of it and do the Fairville Trail. What about Cedar Bay? You know, there's three volunteer groups that keep Cedar Bay going and the trails going there. What kind of help could there be for, for that group? If the application could be um, adjusted in this short time to divide that 1800, 18 million, I think it is. Or no, 1, 000, 1, 800, 000, I think it could be divided up against uh, to all our rec facility. I think I could support it, but $800,000 for just one aspect is just a lot. Thank you. Um, CAO, did you have your hand up? Uh, no, I was just uh, with reference to splitting that, uh, to, the money into different projects. I don't believe we can do that under the funding project, uh, funding program. It has to be uh, one project. Um, our treasurer, uh, would you be able to comment on that? Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Lawrence, the, the funding is deemed to be shovel ready um, for municipalities that have um, um, tried to get quotes and everything beforehand. The project can only be used, the funding can only be used for one particular project. It can't be uh, spread out like kind of like how we do with roads where we have one funding that can do uh, a whole bunch of different areas within uh, the municipality. In this case, that funding can't be used for uh, something similar, even if it's uh, in regards to trails. Thank you. Councillor Howie. Thank you so much. I guess uh, to, to follow up on, on Councillor Timpson's uh, question or, or position, uh, was the application criteria strictly open to municipalities or could organization, organizations such as the Friends of Cedar Bay apply for something like this? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I'd have to look at uh, the funding application a little bit more uh, detailed. I, um, I'm not entirely sure at the moment. Okay. And uh, like Councillor Cassidy said, 27 hours is uh, relatively short duration to consider, but understanding the deadline uh, obviously is fast approaching. Um, I do support the, the enhancement of the Umperville Trail. Potentially the, the revamp could include a renaming of the trail as well. Um, it is definitely deteriorating in some areas, so I do support the repairs in spots. Um, I think I'm, I'm sitting on the fence with Councillor Bath right now, but uh, to quote the mayor, the, the fence may be electrocuted, so you don't want to sit on it too long. Um, so I'll, I'll think long and hard about this one right now. 
Thank you. Um, Councillor Fanlon. Uh, yeah, I think I, I would like to see that uh, we, we started projects on, on the uh, Cedar Bay project, both the buildings and, and the trails. And uh, I would like us to, to see us move that project further ahead and leave the, the trails until an, another time that maybe something else will come up with that there. Thank you. I guess my view is that uh, the municipality, people in the municipality, uh, well, the municipality started the trail in a sense with the uh, the uh, travel information information center project in the late 1980s and put in uh, a, a sidewalk a connecting link let's call it from just east of Moscato's around behind the travel information center through the waterfront park constructed the bridge and, and extended the decided at that time to extend that trail that pathway to um, and I won't get Sturgeon River Road crossing to where the just the street before the forest in it's not Mitchell Drive on the right hand side uh, sorry I'm I'm missing the name but this is Sturgeon River Road intersection a short few years later I can't remember the exact time frame but I'm going to say in the very early 1990s maybe it was started in the late 80s local citizens got together and formed a committee to to start the Umferville Trail uh, to, to lobby and it eventually it became a municipal project and the municipality invested with with the uh, fundraising from from local citizens in in what we call the Umferville Trail about three and a half kilometers of trail from the forest end to the Frog Rapids. In my view that's one of the most used recreation facilities in our community. It is a recreation facility as well as a utility walkway. Um, it's highly used and it's 30, 21, it's at least, it's about 30 years old now. Not to maintain it is an abrogation of our duty to maintain municipal facilities. It is a municipal facility that's highly used as a recreation facility. When we didn't get the large multi-sports tourism complex, we discussed spending money on smaller projects and especially outdoors projects. This was one of them. I fully support this application. Anything further, CAO or treasurer? CAO. Uh, just very quickly, while, while uh, council was uh, discussing the matter, I went uh, online just to answer Councillor Howie's uh, question with uh, reference to eligible applicants. Uh, so non-for-profit organizations, including cooperatives and business improvement areas are also included, municipal and regional governments, rural communities, public sector bodies established under the provincial and territorial statute by regulation, but not wholly owned by the province and indige indigenous organizations. Thanks, CIO. I'll just, just add one more comment that although this is a short turnaround, sometimes funding comes that way. And that's why they talk about having shovel ready or plan ready projects, things that are discussed. We may not be that as far ahead as we would like to be in terms of prioritizing recreational projects, but we certainly prioritize this one as one of the top three, four, five. And here we have an opportunity to do it I, I think uh, it's time to do it. That's my opinion. Council, any further comments before we call the vote? Councillor Timpson. Okay, can it be done cheaper? Why do we need to, not, you know, almost a million dollars contribution? Can it be done less that, fancy and, um, and do some improvements on it? Does it have to be as expensive? That's a lot of money. I would say that you have the opportunity when the funding comes off, it's going to be more expensive if you, if you piecemeal it and you pay for 100% of each pothole later on. Uh, do it one time. It's 30 years old. Asphalt has a life. And 20 years is the life of asphalt if it's trafficked. Asphalt that does not have vehicle traffic on it doesn't last as long. Uh, so the trail certainly isn't lasting as long, but it's lasted 30 years. Um, my opinion and the cost estimate was done was prepared uh, i think um, well i'll let staff say who prepared the, the cost estimate it was uh, it was from our uh, former public works manager andrew jewell so uh, i'm quite sure that andrew knows the pricing of, of these these uh, these things and through you mayor lawrence it, uh, the pricing was updated uh at the beginning of this year thank you did I see another councillor with a with a comment? Uh, Councillor Cassidy, sorry, your hand is yeah. disappearing behind the bridge. Yeah, no, it's, 
Weird. Um, what's the structure of the funding? Like I see, like, how is it, is it broken down by percentage or is it capped at the, uh, the 750? Through, through you, Mayor Lawrence, the project uh, is capped uh, at uh, 750 is the max that um, the funders would approve no matter what the total cost of the project is. So could we, can we look at potentially some of those, those bricks and, and doing that asphalt, those bricks, their cost is almost double, um, potentially spacing out some more of the lighting are, are there things that we could do if we're going to do this to maybe shave down our contribution a bit, still get the job done, still get the trail done, but at not $890,000 long-term debt? Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Lawrence, there are a couple of different avenues that um, we can look at if council chooses to put in a phase one application. The, um, the breakdown of items can be looked um, further on. This is this, there's in order, a phase one application has to go in first. Um, and then there's another phase that has to occur after that application. So there are um, different avenues that we could possibly look at um, after this application is sent in if council were to go that route. Just to clarify, are you saying treasurer that the project could be mod the phase one application goes in and then uh, the, the government agency asks for you move into phase two if you're successful and you can modify the project in phase two. Is that what you're saying? Through you, Mayor Lawrence, sometimes, yes, that can, that can occur. It occurs um, sometimes with a couple of our other projects. Once you get a full design and everything done, uh, the price always uh, fluctuates and everything else. But we can have a deeper conversation with our uh, funders tomorrow and get more of a confirmation in regards to that. Thank you, Councillor Timpson. Okay, can we can we do some fundraising? Can we get the public to to throw the public that use this? Could we have um, lotteries? Could we have GoFundMe? Whatever. This always have to be from the tax base. See you. Uh, fundraising, yes. Lotteries, no. We can't license ourselves to to uh, raise lottery funds, nor can we accept lottery funds for municipal uh, infrastructure. Could we get a Could we get a, a citizens group that uses it to lead this up and possibly do some fundraising? Yeah, as long as it's just strictly fundraising and not through lottery proceeds, then yes. We can accept lottery. Uh, sorry, we can accept fundraising proceeds. Councillor Cassidy, is uh, sponsor a section like can can businesses or, or, or folks sponsor a section of the trail? Is that I guess that would be similar to a donation, but that could be something that we embed in the trail if you sponsor a hundred meters or something like that. Would that be permitted, I guess? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I'd have to refer that to the clerk. Yes, it's permitted. Councillor Timpson. I'd be willing to look at this if we could have a commitment that um, we will go to the public for some sort of a, uh, a fundraising initiative. I don't think we can put this on to the taxpayer at this particular time, but if we can uh, pull together some of the groups that would um, work on this, I think I would be willing to um, support it. I guess that question goes to uh, staff then. Um, can, number one, if, if this is, if the motion is put to the floor, is it understood that uh, there's direction to staff to look at, uh, and it, I guess it falls on staff, uh, to look at somehow organizing a fundraising raising campaign. That is council's wish. I'm sure staff has, has a lot to do. Mr. Clerk. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, uh, I would just ask that if, uh, if that is the case, that the motion be amended to include that specific direction. 
and and I think you're the person who could suggest the amendment. Thanks, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Councilor Cassidy. Yeah, I'd, I'd like that the amended uh, section add about uh, potentially finding some cost savings in the presented budget or breakdown as well. Councilor Howie. Yeah, I, I too uh, support this application and also support the amendment of uh, having community participation and fundraising in that. I would recommend or, or suggest uh, the removal of, of the solar lights. I believe Wabagoon um, had solar lights on, on their trail and later removed them. It could be an avenue of cost savings um, in the revamping of the trail. Um, also, could we just explore the extension of the trail to, the, to what is now or, or currently known as the Umperville Park? Um, in this project, are you suggesting that it be added, uh, that be added, or is it, that's uh, I think the reason it wasn't initially is because uh, of the extreme cost of bedrock on that side of the the sidewalk is on the what would that be the uh, the east side, and the, the bedrock as you go up that hill towards uh, Upperville and talking with MTO that was a, a was a huge cost in, in the initial estimate to get that extension. I think that's why it, it wasn't put in, Councillor Howie. Okay, I, I was just suggesting the, the exploration. Um, maybe that would be a, a separate uh, motion for direction to staff to explore the cost of, of that extension then? Personally, I think it would be best uh, as a, a separate item. It, it's, it's a project I think that would cost as much as this entire project. Uh, it, it's. If you if you're familiar with that, uh, I bike that a lot, and, and it's the bedrock, and there's a big ditch, and, and then there's bedrock. There's there's not much room for a sidewalk. Okay. Uh, Clerk, do you have a, an amended uh, resolution to put to the? Is it the mover we have to go to, mover and seconder? Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence. It's the mover. Thank you. When you're ready. Almost. Okay, sorry. Pressure. <laughs> uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. So I'm proposing, uh, based on council's discussion, two um, additional clauses to the resolution. So. Uh, currently, so the entire resolution would read that council authorizes and directs staff to submit a phase one application to the Canada Community Revitalization Fund for the reconstruction of the Umfraville Trail, um, sorry, Umfraville Recreation Trail, and further that council directs staff to review the specifics of the project to try to find cost savings, and further that council directs staff to create a fundraising campaign by engaging local citizens and community groups to offset the cost of the municipal portion of the project. Thank you, and I'm afraid I don't have uh, a note on who the mover was. So I, uh, I can that help. was uh, Councillor Fenlon. Councillor Fenlon, do you accept that uh, as a, can I call it a friendly amendment, Clerk? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Are there any further comments before the resolution that the clerk has just read is put to the floor? Then I'll ask all in favor. Carried, thank you. Item 7.4, the council awards the contract for the supply and installation of emergency generators at the municipal office, library and the airport administration building to connect electrical for $131,611 plus HST. And further that council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 72-21 being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute an agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Silicote and Canact Electric for the supply and installation of emergency generators at the Municipal Office Library and the Airport Administration Building. Moved by. Councillor Fenlon, seconded by Councillor Bath. Discussion, I'll start with uh, Councillor Bath. Okay, well, after the events of uh, last week or the week before, we certainly know, know the need for emergency uh, generators and whatnot. I'm a little, uh, there's not a lot of detail in what we were asking for here, the type of fueling, the size of generators and whatnot like that, and whether we actually need 
two generating systems with, within the municipal property here between the library and ourselves. I'm not so sure that's what we really need. I am a little concerned when we cut back on the uh, on the uh, the size for the main for the municipal office. I would truly have an emergency generator. We may, may be able to sustain ourselves in the summertime, uh, but we, but can we still sustain ourselves in the wintertime? We have just as much opportunity to have an outage. You know, we 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 run we require the municipal office and the library are both fully electric, even though it's heat pumps in there. They're fully electric. They require a fair amount of power to operate. So I'm not sure what we're actually getting. We're, we're only getting a partial system. When we talked about this a couple of budget sessions ago, the big push was to have uh, the servers kept up. And I support that completely. We need to have our servers running. But I'm not so sure we need to have both the library and the municipal office fully uh, fully maintained if, if, uh, if that's what uh, this, this actually looks. Well, it looks like it doesn't look at that. It looks at only uh, uh, partial uh, uh, power. And when we at the airport, wanna do do we really need an emergency generator at the airport administration office? We have emergency generators at the at the terminal, and certainly, if it means that our our fuel costs, our fuel can't be pumped, then I suppose we do need them out there to some extent. Again, it's very unclear what we're actually getting, so I, I, I'd like to I I'd probably like a little more information on that. Staff. Uh, sure. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, there, there's only one generator provided for the library and town office, and the intent is uh, to just kind of power up the, the backup server in the library and, and the space around the, the server. The, uh, the municipal office will be able to, well, not run at full capacity. It's going to be through this, uh, it's kind of called load management and priority setting. So you kind of set it up in as loads come on, other loads may come off. So the way the the um, the electricians or the people bidding on it explained is that it's it's the it gives you the ability to use a smaller than uh, a smaller generator because of the load management side of things. You can uh, like before it was going to be a 150 kilowatt generator for this building in the library. And we've reduced that to a 60 kilowatt, which again should be able to maintain normal operations. Because in the reality is, you don't utilize the entire load of a building uh, when it's operating. You know, so the idea of this is there's systems in place that'll be in the mechanical room that will kind of prioritize loads and maintain kind of the operation of the building. And same thing with the. Uh, with the airport and min building. If I wish Ben was here, this was kind of, I kind of took on this project because we were looking at it here. So we combined the two. Uh, he could probably better explain why they need to keep the airport and min building operating. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think you're gonna see for the most part, normal operations and it's, it's a lot less than what it was. I mean, the quotes we had before were upwards of Five hundred eighty-three thousand for the for all like for the three buildings, not, and that wasn't full capacity over at the library. Uh, Clerk, did you want to add to that? Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, I can provide a little bit of insight into the rationale for the airport. Uh, it also has its own servers, uh, so they also need to be maintained, uh, which are located in the administration building. Uh, the phone system will not work without electricity in any municipal facility. Uh, so those are two critical, um, from an IT perspective anyway, two critical reasons why uh, the airport also needs to have backup power. Councilor Bath, anything further? No, that, that's that's pretty. That's sort of satisfying. Where that the, the, the sixty kilowatts was was exactly where I had worked out. So I'm quite happy with that. Neither means they're right or I'm right for both of us. So I, that's okay. And uh, I, I just uh, the difference in the quotes between the two companies. It, it uh, you know, it obviously it probably indicates a different type of generator, different fuel systems and whatnot. So I, I'm wondering what kind of uh, if. And I'm assuming the, and that's probably wrong. I'm going to assume, assume that these are propane uh, power generators, so that so there will be other costs associated with it and other uh, clearances required if that's the case. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Yeah, they are. Uh, it's LP. It's propane fuel. It's propane fired uh, 
generators uh, there and they were the, the brand that were like the accepted quote is Kohler, which we already have. We have the Kohler generator up at the water treatment plant. And, uh, and the other company was a Blue Star. Uh, Blue Star, I think it's called uh, generator. And they were more expensive, but also their labor cost was twice as much as this fellow, the, the one we've accepted as well. So. Any further, Councillor Bath? No, that's good, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, uh, I'll just go around, Councillor Lego. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the clarification there. Um, I know it's a bit more expensive, but uh, these things need to get done and servers and everything else needs to be protected. So we do need them. Thank you, Councillor Timpson. Uh, no, no comments. Councillor Howie. Uh, the only question uh, that I have was was from uh, from a taxpayer. Just for clarity, um, why would uh, power need to be provided to the library servers in a backup setting? Uh, yeah, I'll Sorry. through Mayor Lawrence. I'll let Brian take that one. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. So uh, the way our uh, server system is set up, we have uh, redundancies. Uh, so the primary servers are in the municipal office. The redundancy servers are in the uh, library. Uh, and so um, in order uh, to avoid data corruption, uh, damage and issues with the uh, because they're not just backed up once a day, they're backed up multiple times a day uh, to uh, to meet our obligations uh, with respect to record keeping um, and uh, electronic documents. So uh, both the primary and uh, the, um, the backup or, uh, you know, the server both need to be kept operational for the duration of the outage. Thank you. Councillor Fanlon. Uh, no comment on it. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Thank you. Just uh, I have a question. I'm sorry if I, if I missed this. Um, in this the load capacity and the shifting of, of things, it, heat cool in the municipal building, do, will this power the heating system? I can, I wouldn't say, I don't think it could power the entire system, but definitely a portion of the system. Uh, we could, what we kind of discussed in these situations, potentially kind of plug in portable heaters in the winter time if needed uh, to kind of to pick up anything that we can't get with the, the generator. But, you know, we'll still have the 120 as well as possibly portable air conditioners in the summer if, uh, you know, there's more load than we than we need or the more load, not enough load available to run the entire system. So I guess it does. I just can certainly when the heating, when the building calls for heat, bang the loads there I, I don't maybe there's something i'm missing here either it can handle the load load within that that 60 kilowatts or it, it can't if, if that if it's handling the heat can it handle anything else or, uh, yeah so sorry i i don't know the exact no, i don't know how much power usage each uh, water to air heat pump uses i know they don't all operate at the same time so again i guess i should have had the the company come here because I can't explain those finer details. I know he said this is the course, the path a lot of places are taking because then rather than having these very large, large generators that typically don't run at full capacity because of, uh, you know, because again, you're not, you're not utilizing the entire load of a building. Um, as I understand it, we should be able to run with heating and cooling. And like I say, if there is an instance where let's say we need to operate the elevator, you may have to shed some load to run the elevator so to speak so is there some is there a brain is there a, is there a processor that's involved in this to to distribute the load is that okay all right exactly yeah you set priorities certain things will be priority number one would be the servers and then maybe your electrical outlets and uh lighting and then your heating system and then your you know you would kind of set priorities and as things you know like the elevator would kind of be your last priority. So then they would shed that power first if needed. And if you need the elevator, you can kind of control the system manually to operate the elevator if needed in those circumstances. Great, thank you. Um, Councillor Fanlon. 
is there a, maybe we should look at having um, some some other kind of hookup for uh, an outside generator to plug into if in the need that it's going to be uh, like a week down or uh, over over the winter time to supply heat to the building because that, that could be done and generators are you can get them out any rental company and big ones small ones so i guess what you say, if if need be in, in an emergency if we needed to augment this with an, another generator i think is what you're saying yes yeah Okay, and not part of this this motion, but uh, a good point. The uh, I think it's it's critical that uh, you know, this isn't just about the municipal building library and, and the airport. I mean, this is about the municipality. When the power went out in in the municipality, uh, maybe many citizens realize it, and maybe some don't. But they turn to the municipality. It's the emergency management control group. It's the emergency management falls to the municipality. We have to have the power to to uh, to help the, the residents of the municipality get get through situations such as we just did, I think it's it's critical. We are the the managers of emergencies, so we need to be, have the uh, the auxiliary capacity to be able to to manage those situations. So I I fully support this. It sounds like it, it's been thought out, and I was surprised actually the cost is considerably lower than I thought it would have been. Anything further, Council? All right, then I think we can just call the motion that's uh, on the floor. All in favor? Sorry, all in favor, carried, thank you. Just some councillors are, the virtual background is, the hands are disappearing and some councillors are so small on the screen, I can't quite see their hand. Um, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Wave, wave vigorously, thank you, whether you're in support or not. Or, or whether you're not in support, way figures. Um, item 7.5, the council awards the contract for the municipal office HVAC upgrades to earth for you for $147,488 plus HST. And further, the council authorizes the passing of bylaw number 71-21, being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute an agreement between the corporation of the municipality to look out and earth for you for the HVAC upgrades at the municipal office. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Fenlon. And I'll start the discussion with Councillor Bath. Yeah, I, I fully support this. Uh, I, uh, I've, I've been calling for this for several budgets now in, in, in its full capacity. The one the only question I have is I, I want to make sure that, that this has a, a non proprietary control system that's operating it. When the, when the system was originally put in the municipal office uh, in, in its first upgrade, uh, it actually had a proprietary control system and it worked very, very well. The, uh, the front part of the building would heat the back and the back part would cool the front. You know, it was very, very efficient. When the control system started to die, it became less and less efficient. And until the point now, we're really, it's pretty hard to control. So I just want to make sure that we have a, a control system that's going to work the way it should. The system is well designed uh, now that it's been changed, I, I guess, probably about a couple of years after it was put in. And, uh, and I think it would, it'll lend also to being to operate the full system when we have, when we have to run on the generators, because if it's running right, there, it, it doesn't require a lot of power. So I don't, if you could just clarify that, Jody, if we have, if it has some kind of a, a non-proprietary system that somebody's going to look after. What happened with the other one is that when the, the, the people who designed it left the area, we completely lost all our control over how it ran. That's the only question. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, that's definitely something I'll confirm with the contractor and, and keep, that, keep that in mind as we go through the process here. Thank you. Uh, around the table, uh, Councillor Timpson. Uh, no questions of support, support this. Councillor Howley. No questions, I support this. Thank you, Councillor Lego. No, I like the fact that the government's thrown in $100,000, so I support this. Thank you, Councillor Fenlon. Uh, I support it. Councillor Cassidy. Oh, Councillor Lego's comments and I support this. <laughs> All right, 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I will. Uh, thank you, staff, for putting this together, and thank you, Councillor Bath, for the history. Uh, and I know it's been something that's been uh, needed for some time. Um, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item 7.6. The Council, in its ongoing commitment to promote diversity, inclusion, and equity, authorizes and directs the clerk to arrange for the painting of the Wellington Street and Lakeshore Drive pedestrian crossing using the progress flag as the image to be imposed on the pavement. Moved by. Councillor Timpson, seconded by Councillor Fanelin, and I'll start the discussion with Councillor Lego. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Sylvia McDonald for bringing this forward. Um, I would support having one at the Lakeshore Drive as we're developing the uh, new waterfront development. Um, that is a place of gathering of the people. Um, so for me, that is where I would like to see it. Uh, the other one on Wellington, I probably would not like to see it. I prefer it just to stay as a, as a, as a crosswalk there. So I would support the, the one spot. Thank you. Um, I'll go around the table to uh, Councillor Bath. Yeah, I, I'm okay with it. I don't really have any uh, indication whether I um, care for it or not, but I'm okay to support it. I think it's kind of a... a, a... Thank you. Councillor Timpson. Yeah, I support it. I just, uh, it's kind of confusing where it's going to be. There's no real crosswalk. There's no crosswalk at Lakeshore and Wellington. It's just a stop sign right at the uh, at the water treatment there. Um, is it going to be on Wellington or is it going to be on Lakeshore? And there's no crossing there, so I'm, just, clerk. I'm confused about it. Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence. So just to clarify, Councillor Timpson, we only have about two or three crosswalks, legal crosswalks in the whole municipal two, I believe. Uh, so everything else is what's considered a pedestrian crossing. So the, you know, the, the sidewalk does come down to street level there. You can, you across the street and it goes back up to sidewalk level on the, on the opposite side. So essentially it's at the intersection of Wellington Street and Lakeshore um, Drive. Um, the, uh, it'll be on the pavement from one side, one crosswalk ends to where the other crosswalk begins. Or a sidewalk, sorry, where one sidewalk ends, painted on the pavement, um, and will stop where the other sidewalk commences on the other side of the road. On Wellington? Well, well, at Wellington and Lakeshore. Technically, it'll be on the top of um, Lakeshore, uh, not yeah. on Wellington itself. Okay, I, I do like the idea, Councillor Lego's idea of being by the town beach. So maybe the actual end um, sorry. location could be. Um, that, sorry, Councillor Timson, that is the location. That, that, that is where it is. I, I, can I clarify some confusion here? I, okay. I think there's only one crossing being, and it's the crossing of where Lakeshore intersects with Wellington Avenue at the town beach uh, road entry. Oh, oh, you mean, okay, you mean, um, the street where you live on, Mr. That's Mayor. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking of... Um, uh, yes. I was thinking of uh, Government Row as Lakeshore. Okay, pardon me. No, this is... So Lakeshore Drive is the is the is essentially the the vehicle entry to uh, to the town beach. And it's yeah, the entry okay. to, to Lakeshore Drive that services uh, about uh, 30 residents down, down that way. Right, uh, okay. And my understanding, and I'll go back to Council Lego in a second, because I wanted to make sure... When I read this, I thought there was only one one being done at that that crossing that the clerk has described. So I think Councillor Lego, go ahead. Yeah, uh, sorry for starting some confusion, but when I read it, I thought they were, they were asking for one at Tim Horton's Welling, the crossing, and then one at Lakeshore. So I'm supportive of the one at Lakeshore, so we're all good. <laughs> okay, we'll get through this. Um, Councillor Howie. Yeah, first, I just wanted to thank Sylvia McDonald for making this request uh, back in June. Um, I do appreciate also the amendment made um, to be respective of all communities. But uh, like I said, I fully support this. I like the spot, like the one spot. 
of it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Fenlon. Uh, I have no, no, nothing to say about it. It's going to be a good spot there. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. No, I'm good with it. Thank you. So to sum up, we're doing three intersections at the, no, I'm just, <laughs> I think it's a, a wonderful spot. I think as Councillor Lego was uh, made the case for it, <laughs> for the case for what we already had is it's a highly visible location, the public gatherings. Uh, I think it's a very uh, appropriate location. Thanks, Mrs. McDonald. And thanks uh, staff for, for putting this together. I think we're ready to call the vote on this. And I think we all understand the one thing we're voting for. All in favor. Carried, thank you. 7.7 7, and I will let you, we did, this wasn't lifted, sorry. So it's not necessary. That, that concludes the uh, items requiring separate discussion. Um, and that moves us to uh, bylaws. And why did you lead us through that, Clerk? Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, thank you. Uh, so the following uh, bylaws are um, uh, put before Council for uh, consideration, three readings and passing. Uh, bylaw number 6621, being a bylaw to authorize uh, the Mayor and the Clerk um, to execute an agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Sioux Lookout and Team Eagle Limited for the provision of a runway sweeper and associated training in the amount of $359,320 plus HST. Bylaw number 7121, being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and the clerk to execute an agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulicout and earth for you for the HVAC upgrades at the municipal office. Bylaw number 7221, being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and the clerk uh, to execute an agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Sulicote and Connect Electric for the supply and installation of emergency generators at the Municipal Office, Library and Airport Administration Building. Bylaw number 67-21 being a bylaw to close, declare surplus and authorize the sale of a highway of the municipality. Uh, and that council, uh, so the motion is that council um, gives three reading and passes those bylaws. Moved by. Councillor Timpson, seconded by Councillor Bath. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And outside resolutions, we have, uh, sorry, notices of motion to reconsider. There are none. And we do have an outside resolution request for endorsement of the Alberton Council resolution seeking action to address drought impact in district and area. Mr. Clerk, why don't you lead me through this? Uh, certainly through you, Mayor Lawrence. So um, occasionally, uh, typically, so council receives the council correspondence list every month. And uh, of course, if there's any resolutions on there that uh, council wishes to endorse and provide support to, members are um, always invited to contact myself or the deputy clerk to, uh, to bring those items forward on a subsequent agenda. Uh, occasionally, however, um, staff will identify a resolution um, that, uh, um, you know, sort of either has regional impact Act or uh, may otherwise be of interest to council. And so this is one of those examples. Uh, one of our neighboring municipalities is, is looking for some help. And uh, so we, we thought we would put this before council um, uh, to see if you also wish to uh, uh, endorse and, and lobby the province for what um, uh, Alberton is, is asking for. Uh, so in this case, essentially um, um, what they're asking the uh, the province of Ontario and the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs to do is three things. Uh, one, designate the Rainy River District as an area impacted by drought. Uh, two, declare an agriculture state of emergency um, within um, the Rainy River District. And three, uh, implement a recovery assistance program uh, to support uh, local uh, agricultural sector. So that's essentially what, uh, what the resolution is, is about. So, Mr. Kirk, you can help me. Uh, we need to, that we would need to put this on the floor in the usual way uh, to pass the resolution, or how do we do that? Yeah. So essentially, so the uh, so the the details of the resolution are are uh, in the attachment. Um, mm -hmm. I, if you like, I can read it for you the the full resolution, uh, and then it would just be a matter of asking for a mover and seconder, and uh, and so on. 
Well, I think everybody's read the resolution. Uh, I would guess it, because it's in the report. So I'm not going to ask. I don't think we need to ask you to do that. Uh, what I will do, though, is ask for a mover and a seconder, so uh, to see if there's any discussion and find out if there's support for it or not. So move. Is there a mover? Councillor Lego, seconder. Seconded by Councillor Timpson. Thank you. And discussion. Uh, I'll start with the mover and seconder. Councillor Lego. Yeah, no, I fully support this. We understand that there is a drought going on, as we can attest from the fires around here, and they're losing a lot of feed for for their animals and cattle. So, um, the province needs to recognize that um, they're they're in dire straits as well. So, we can't just always focus on southern Ontario. We need to focus on on our neighbors up here too that are that are facing some some hard times. So, I support this. Thank you, Councillor Timpson. Uh, no, I can. Councillor Lego has expressed my sentiments. Thank you. Uh, anybody else at the council table wish to say to speak to the issue? Councillor Howley. Yep, I was just going to uh, express my full support for for this resolution, and uh, obviously we understand the importance of local ag agriculture, and we're all feeling the regional impacts as we see uh, more. Uh, remote communities impacted and more individuals displaced due to forest fires in our region. Um, so I fully, uh, fully express my support for this and lobbying the province. Anything further, Council? Yeah, I'd echo, echo Councillor Lego's initial comments. And when you, you see the map of, of the, uh, the drought monitor and how the highly impacted in, in the southwestern part of northwestern Ontario, if I can call it that, down in the Rennie River District, so agricultural down there. And uh, as Councillor Lego said, uh, the northwest shouldn't be left off. There is agriculture up here and the province needs to recognize it and recognize that they need support. So I'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. We rarely get uh, get those coming to the council table. So thanks, Clerk, for leading me through that. Um, questions, comments, uh, members' reports. Um, we'll go around the table, starting with Councillor Lego. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, attended the uh, declaration of emergency after the storm on June 24th, uh, July 8th. Uh, I attended the uh, Kenora Home for the Age uh, but I also missed the municipal meeting on the same day. Uh, it was a bit short notice for me to make, make any changes. So my apologies for not attending your meeting. Uh, July 12th, um, I answered my phone this time um, for the emergency control group meeting. Uh, I missed the one on Sunday. Uh, I was having a nap, sorry. Um, and on July 15th, uh, the hydro shareholder meeting. So that was my month, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bath. Other than normal, the normal council stuff, they, I, we, we haven't had the base meetings this uh, month. Uh, we we take July off. And uh, the only thing I can report from PACE is we, uh, we, we will we'll be looking for a new CEO. So if you have somebody who's interested, then there'll be an ad, the ads coming out soon. So I encourage them to, to apply. Thank you. Councillor Timpson. I've attended two KDMA meetings. Um, KDMA is putting in a delegation to AMO. They haven't been approved as of yet. Um, so the, the petitioning the province to sell provincial crown land within municipal boundaries to the municipalities uh, to sell it at, at a decent, not not at the um, not at market rates, but to help out municipalities in this way by increasing their land base. Um, had several meetings at the library, uh, four or five meetings actually, because our, our CEO is uh, uh, on an extended um, leave. And um, so we've been uh, working to, uh, to uh, keep the doors open, which we are doing quite successfully. Um, the Environment Committee is adjourned for the summer, but um, our activities keep on. Um, we have one member who does the honoring of citizens who are environmental stewards and uh, uh, the curbside swap keeps going. And um, that's about it other than the regular and uh, special meetings that we've had. That's my month. Thank you, Councillor Howie. 
Regrettably, I could not attend the hydro shareholders meeting. Um, however, I, I, we, I, I did attend the bringing our children home gathering in Laxul, and I want to thank Chief Bull and Laxul First Nation for leading in that area and, and calling to uh, calling for action. Um, also, the, also, I regrettably could not attend the ActDev um, committee meeting. However, without quorum, it, it did not occur. Um, and with the storm, we're quite busy um, clearing the streets with the Suica Fire Department. So. Uh, it was great to see the community come together. And again, I want to thank the municipality for operating the, the landfill. Um, and now we have a quite a surplus of brush. So maybe a community fire is in order. Thank you, Councillor Fallon. Um, been pretty quiet, nothing for the LCC and, and what's an advisory is off right now. And then I guess the only thing I attended was the hydro board meeting. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yeah, I covered Councillor Nilego's nap for the, uh, the controller group meeting. And uh, other than that, my committees are uh, on hiatus for the, the summer. Um, just, just involved in uh, some of the other organizations I'm involved with in the community. Just work on those, that's about it for me. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Councillors Lego and Cassidy uh, for filling in for me. I was uh, I, I took advantage of the opening up and I went to Thunder Bay that weekend to visit family, and then uh, of course that that all came to be. So thanks for for covering for me. Um, because of the long period, I think we're five weeks since the last regular council meeting. There's been two, time for two uh, KD, KDSB board meetings and. I attended uh, the announcement from the federal government on the Universal Broadband Fund, a successful application that KDSB made to uh, to bring a broadband upgrade, to bring the Starlink uh, actually internet access to, I think about 3,000 uh, people across the, uh, the Kenora district. Um, interviews with Wawate and uh, Dougal Media and Thunder Bay, and uh, I guess the local bulletin. Um, and uh, attended the M3C meeting, the last one we had. We've had a special police services board meeting dealing with the, the bush camp that then, then was taken down uh, in uh, the east side of town. We had our regular police services board meeting today. Uh, we've had, I think, three special council meetings, council, in, between the last regular meeting and this one. Um, so that's uh, been busy for, for all of us. Um, I attended a, a, you'll recall the name George Cuff. I know that uh, Councillor Timpson does and uh, for sure and, and, and Councillor Bath, maybe all do. Uh, there was a, an opportunity for mayors that, that Cuff's organization put out for mayors to attend uh, a special uh, webinar, I guess you'd call it leadership from the head of the table. So I, I took part in that and heard Mr. Cuff's admonitions, which are much the same as we've all heard before, I think. Uh, the tune is, is usually the same. Um, health unit board meeting uh, and attended the municipal update meetings with the health unit vulnerable population uh, group call that is now transitioning, I think, to become part of the healthy community task force. Uh, attended, uh, again, we'd put our name in uh, the municipalities having an interest in what I would call the, the ring of fire access road, which is actually being called the Martin Falls First Nation access road. So we put our names in as interested stakeholders and lo and behold, I was, I thought that was, this was gonna be multiple parties, but there I was on a call with uh, six people, I think two First Nation representatives, uh, two from the consultant and two others. And it was just us that uh, this presentation was for, for the municipality. I just, uh, uh, on behalf of council and municipality made clear that any, I, 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 I once again sort of lobbied for, um, an overall plan for accessing the north rather than higgledy piggledy one mine one one uh, forestry company at a time develop an all weather road access plan to the communities and then do spin offs to the mines and i also advocated for sula coat saying that any any road should look at the downstream impact any mining access road or first nation impact road where they go can have serious impacts on the the municipalities downstream such as pickle lake sula coat dryden uh, if they decide to, to take roads in other directions than traditional service patterns. 
of course, they were surprised that we were such a health center, education center. It's always amazing what's not known out there, how busy our airport is. So uh, on the one hand, I was surprised to be uh, the only one on this call. On the other hand, I was very pleased to be able to, to uh, speak on behalf of the municipality. Uh, attended the AMO Board uh, Indigenous Relations Task Force uh, meeting, and uh, I'm part of the Health Task Force, so I'll be moderating uh, uh, an AMO uh, uh, conference event on Ontario health teams, which is very interesting, the rollout of Ontario health teams, which uh, we wonder about in Sulacoat, what's happening. Um, TRC meeting, we had uh, that just this week uh, and attended uh, the Bring Our Children Home event uh, with uh, CAO La Rose, and that was quite a, an event out in Lac Sul, as Councillor Howie mentioned. Uh, and today I met with uh, uh, MP Eric Malello uh, to talk about uh, various uh, things. I think that what I talked about with Eric was the border reopening, uh, CMHC, the rapid housing initiatives, asking him to, to lobby for hours. Um, talked about the single use plastics and the bylaw that came uh, to uh, Sula Couch and the considerations and asked uh, the position, you know, federal government just saying that we're hoping that something's happening. Um, asked about the election call and that was imponderable, but uh, nobody knows. Um, and we talked about the bringing our children home and the Indigenous burials and the need for the focus not just to be on residential school sites, but that the government should recognize that municipalities are involved through our, our cemeteries. Uh, the zone hospital is really between indigenous organizations and the federal government. It is on zone, it's on federal property, but uh, that municipalities not be overlooked in this funding and that we would like indigenous agencies to lead this, uh, but we need to be included to resolve that. And it wouldn't be a satisfactory conclusion if they only looked at residential schools because there will still be uh, lots of, uh, hanging chads, whatever you want to call it. There will be lots of issues outstanding. Uh, so that was, uh, it's more than a month. It was five weeks, uh, my five weeks. And now we have a closed session uh, to move into to discuss matters of general nature. And we'll move into closed session at 7.47 PM. Uh, subject matter relating to the personal matters about identifiable individuals, including municipal or local board employees per Municipal Act 2001 as amended. And there is one item, council boards, commissions, and committees membership. Moved by Councillor Lego, seconded by Councillor Timpson. Then we move into closed session. All in favor? Carried. We had to get that in before we, we're moving in before we got the motion, sorry, clerk. I'll just, just click join now.